Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for this webinar is Connecticut's low and moderate income solar customer segmentation analysis. This webinar is presented by the Clean Energy States Alliance as part of the Sustainable Solar Education Project. This project is supported by the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies Office. Before I pass it over to our host for this webinar and to our guest speakers, I'd like to go over a few. For this webinar, I'm in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of this webinar. You can either call in using a telephone or you can join using your computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize your webinar console so that you can view the, view the presentation full screen, you can click on the little orange arrow that you see there circled. Uh, you can also use that arrow to expand the webinar console. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions and comments as you think of them throughout the webinar by typing them into the question box in your webinar console and hitting send. We will be reading through your questions as they come in and we will get to as many questions as time allows. We expect to have a lot of people on the webinar and that should mean a lot of questions. So don't wait until the very end to submit your question. Type it in when you think of it. We will get to as many as we can. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will be posting slides and a recording of this webinar on our website and we will send you an email with those materials within about 24 to 48 hours. You can find those materials uh, from today's webinar, as well as slides and recordings from all of our previous webinars on CISA's website at cisa.org backslash webinars. And with that, I would like to pass it over to our host for this webinar, Diana Chase. Diana is a program associate here at the Clean Energy States Alliance, and she is going to get us started. Diana? Thank you, Samantha. As Sam said, I'm Diana Chase, and I'm a program associate at the Clean Energy States Alliance, or CESA. We're here today to talk about Connecticut's low and moderate income solar customer segmentation analysis. But first, let me just briefly introduce you to CESA. We're a coalition of public energy agencies, mostly state agencies from around the country, working together to advance clean energy. You can see our members here. We're presenting this webinar today as part of our Sustainable Solar Education Project. The Sustainable Solar Education Project, which is funded by a grant from the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies Office, provides information and educational resources to help states and municipalities ensure distributed solar electricity remains consumer friendly and benefits low and moderate income households. The Sustainable Solar Education Project provides guides, webinars, and other resources. It also has a free monthly newsletter highlighting news from around the country on solar consumer protection and equitability. Uh, Sam, if you can advance the slide, you can find all of these resources at the link at the bottom of the screen. As part of the Sustainable Solar Education Project, we're producing a series of webinars this fall and winter on low and moderate income solar program design. As part of this series, today's webinar will discuss Connecticut's low and moderate income customer segmentation analysis. Our learning objectives for today's webinar are to recognize some of the differences within low and moderate income populations and to consider how these differences can be used to identify and reach those customers who might be most interested in solar. I'd like to introduce our speakers now. Um, Isabel Hazelwood is Associate Manager of Statutory and Infrastructure Programs at the Connecticut Green Bank. She manages the Green Bank's participation in Federal Department of Energy Solar Energy Technology Office programs and other initiatives to facilitate faster and cheaper solar PV deployment. Isabel's expertise lies in developing and implementing strategies that address regulatory barriers to solar deployment at the state and local level. 
Prior to joining the Green Bank, Isabel worked at several nonprofit organizations focused on community and brownfield redevelopment in New York City. Alex Bradley is a senior account executive at CNC East. Over the course of his career, Alex has managed a wide variety of projects across multiple industries, including planning and executing integrated marketing campaigns for Transportation Security Administration's PreCheck program and Columbia Gas of Massachusetts energy efficiency programs. Alex has also completed branding and outreach projects for Amoresco, the Department of Defense's MilitaryChildCare.com program, Architect of the Capitol, US EPA's Energy Star program, and Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. And now I'll turn the platform over to Isabel. Isabel? Thanks, Diana. Um, to get us started, I'm just going to give a quick introduction to the Green Bank and um, some background on this project. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the Connecticut Green Bank, we are a quasi-public state agency in Connecticut. We're actually the nation's first Green Bank, and our mission is to use our limited public dollars to attract private investment in Connecticut's clean energy economy to make clean energy um, both easier to access and more affordable for Connecticut residents. And in 2016, we actually added a fourth goal to our organization's mission, which is to support affordable and healthy buildings in low to moderate income and distressed communities in Connecticut. So while we partner with private capital providers to enable financing for clean energy projects in the residential, commercial, and multifamily spaces, one of the biggest residential programs that we have in Connecticut is our residential solar investment program. And this is a declining incentive program open to owner-occupied households, single-family households in Connecticut. Um, we launched this program in 2012, and after it launched, we saw a huge growth in our residential solar PV market in Connecticut, um, even as subsidies continue to decline. So that was very encouraging, um, but when we started to take a look at the market and the distribution of solar adoption throughout the state in late 2013, early 2014, we saw that um, penetration was much higher in upper income census tracts than it was in our lower income census tracts. And in fact, in 2014, only 29% <clears throat> of residential solar projects were in census tracts with a median income less than 100% of the area median. So that kind of signaled to us that we needed to take a closer look at our low to moderate income communities and think hard about different programs and strategies that we could employ to um, boost solar adoption in those areas and achieve more equitable distri distribution of our resources. Um, so as a first step to that, we kind of had to take a hard look at our low to moderate income market in Connecticut, and part of that was actually defining what we mean when we talk about low and moderate income households. Um, so in Connecticut, we have a state median income of about $70,000, but we also have um, very large discrepancies in the median income depending on the ge geography that you're looking at in the state. So sometimes that differential can be as much as $20,000. And for that reason, we decided to use area median income instead of state median income as our proxy for um, <clears throat> defining low income and moderate income. And that also helps us align with our other um, state housing agencies. And so when we started to look at the census data sorry, to see um, where these households were located in the state and kind of how much of our population was living in these lower income areas, we found that there was actually a large opportunity amongst lower income um, homeowners. So in Connecticut, about 40% of um, households earning less than 80% of AMI are homeowners, and 65% of households earning 80 to 100% of AMI are homeowners. Um, so that was one great opportunity for us because traditionally our programs were focused on um, owner-occupied households in Connecticut, so that seemed like a strong market opportunity to pursue right off the bat. <clears throat> and then another key um, element to designing our low-income strategy was to use market research to really hone in on our target audience and understand their needs and their desires and how we can 
um, adapt our messaging and our program offerings to really tap into that market. And we had done some market research previously that highlighted some potential opportunities amongst these lower income constituents. Um, so one was a 2012 analysis of credit quality um, of Connecticut residents that showed us that income and FICO score don't necessarily correlate in Connecticut and that there's a large population of lower income households within the state who have very strong credit quality. Um, and additionally, we ran a market segmentation in 2014 of all of the customers who had gone solar um, through our residential solar investment program, <clears throat> regardless of income, just everyone who had gone solar, and saw that even within that already there was a lower income market segment that was interested in going solar. So that was also very encouraging to see that the, the demand was there. We just needed to um, really focus on how we could reduce barriers to access for these communities and make it a more direct um, strategy to help these lower income communities learn about the benefits and paths that they have um, available to them to go solar. So in 2015, um, we brought to market a couple of different strategies for achieving that goal. One thing that we did was launch um, a LMI incentive within our residential solar investment program. Um, this elevated incentive is about three times higher than our market rate incentive, and it's available to households um, earning 100% or below of the area median income. Um, but in order for a customer to access that incentive, we actually only allow qualified contractors to access that incentive um, so that we can review the products that they're bringing to market and ensure that the value of that elevated incentive is really being passed through to the end customer and having a significant impact um, on their energy burden. And then simultaneously with that, we launched an RFQ for an investment in a contractor partner um, to develop or launch within the Connecticut market um, solar products that were specifically aimed at lower income consumers. And out of that, we developed a partnership with a company called Posigen, um, who has a solar for all model that relies on alternative underwriting to offer solar leases, um, as well as energy efficiency savings agreements to customers to really help them have holistic solutions for reducing their energy costs. And then lastly, although not um, specifically focused at low income, we also launched a credit challenge version of our Smarty Loan product. Um, we partnered with an organization in Connecticut called Capital for Change to do that. And it allows customers um, with FICOs as well as 580 to qualify for a Smarty Loan to finance both solar and energy efficiency measures in their home. So, we brought <clears throat> all of these solutions to the market around 2015, and we've been tracking progress to date in um, penetration of our lower income census tracks. And we've actually seen um, very strong growth in those markets. So in 2017, actually about 48% of solar PV projects, residential solar PV projects in Connecticut were installed in uh, census tracks less than 100% of the area median income. So we're starting to get to that parity level between upper income and lower income census tracts. But one of the most interesting things about that, that growth is that in 2017, only about 32% of the solar projects installed in those lower income air areas were positive projects. So 70% of those lower income customers were choosing to go solar not necessarily through one of the specific programs that the Green Bank has been promoting um, as avenues to reduce um, barriers to access for those communities. And so that's kind of what prompted us to engage with C plus C to better understand this market segment <clears throat> and uh, wrap our heads around the demand that we were seeing in the lower income market in the state. And so we had a, about 4,000 um, projects at that point in census tracts less than 80% of area median income, and we turned those over to C plus C in January of this year to do a market segmentation analysis for us um, and found some really interesting results. So for that, I'll pass it over to Alex to kind of take you through the findings. 
Hello, everybody. I am Alex Bradley. Thank you, Isabel. Um, and just a little bit about C plus C social marketing and PR. I'm based out of our Boston office. We're actually uh, headquartered out in Seattle, though, and we do uh, a lot of work primarily with social good type clients, everything from clean energy to healthcare to traffic safety. Um, and like Isabel was saying, we've been working with Connect Green Bank for you know about a year now on uh, segmentation projects like the one that I'm about to go over here. So if I can, there we go. Uh, so quick agenda, just I'm going to go over the assignment overview, which Isabel just alluded to a little bit. I'll go over our high level findings, uh, customer personas, which based on the overall target audiences that we come up with, we basically created customer personas for each audience that kind of help visualize who they are, who the likely customer is as an individual. And then we'll talk about where their geography is within Connecticut, potential marketing strategies, and how we can uh, use this data. So assignment overview, uh, we developed a segmentation model of solar customers to help inform cost-effective acquisition strategies. Again, using that list of 4,000 customers provided by Connect and Green Bank. Um, we're interested in servicing the low to moderate income homeowners in Connecticut. We want to define low to moderate income market segments that have a high potential for uh, rooftop solar to become customers for rooftop solar. We want to uncover insights to help uh, target help targeted marketing approaches aimed at high potential audiences, and we want to determine how to best utilize the data and these insights to help develop messaging and media recommendations. So really quickly about our methodology here, we were provided the list of low to moderate income uh, solar customers in Connecticut. We provided that to a company called Claritas, uh, which geocoded that list uh, and assigned each one of those to uh, what are referred to as Prism Premier uh, lifestyle segments, which some of you may have heard of. Basically, these are lifestyle segments that everyone in the country falls into. They're based on kind of general demographics, uh, geography, income, uh, and a variety of other uh, variables that kind of put everyone into these individual groups. So everyone in that list that we provided them with was assigned to one of these lifestyle segments. Once they were assigned to these lifestyle segments, they were able to construct five different target audience groups made up of multiple like-minded Prism Premier segments. Uh, they provided descriptive behavioral data and ge uh, geographical data along with these individual uh, five target audience groups, which we then took, we analyzed for high-level findings, and developed some market and messaging insights for each of those target audiences. Uh, so to go over our high-level findings, uh, like I said, there was five total target audiences. You can see here uh, Connecticut target count and Connecticut target index. Um, just a little bit of background information about this to better understand what this means, and you can find this in the appendix of this presentation as well. Uh, count and index are terms used to determine the likelihood of a target audience to exhibit a certain behavior. So in this case, that behavior is purchasing solar. So the count is the universe against which that product profile is compared to. It's the total population. Uh, the index is the extent to which the usage of the product, solar, uh, is concentrated in a given neighborhood type in relation to the average of 100. So anything above 100 index is more likely to exhibit that behavior. Anything under 100 is less likely to exhibit that behavior. Um, so you can see the uh, chart on the right here, the, three, the last three target audiences have higher indices uh, while the first two have lower. Uh, and one other thing to note on this is that we did end with five target audiences, but the last three here, not only do they have higher indices, but they are actually also lower income, which is where we want to focus our efforts on for this specific project. Uh, so everything we go over from this point on will be focused on those uh, that dollars and cents, seeking stability and surviving, not thriving. Uh, also, those are names that we apply to these target audiences uh, to help better visualize and better uh, represent, make it easier to refer to the uh, given target audience. So those are names created by us. Moving into customer personas. So again, we created personas based on each of these individual target audiences to talk about who the likely customer is. So starting with dollars and cents, going over some key demographics of this group. Uh, they're a, you know, a family in their mid-30s. They're going to have some kids. They're college educated. This is uh, this is the higher income of, of the three groups that we'll look at today. 
Um, one thing to keep in mind is that this is based in Connecticut, so while this is kind of a, a lower income group in Connecticut, Connecticut does tend to have higher median household incomes, higher home values, uh, things like that compared to a lot of other places in the country. Uh, but this is a couple that's married, it's a group that's uh, ethnically diverse, and it's also our largest of the three groups. So with that, we develop our customer persona. Again, this is uh, mid-30s with college, with you know three kids, they're college educated, white collar. Uh, Judy works, um, you know, she, she works a white collar job, she's going back to school to get a graduate degree. Dante is more of a white collar businessman. They're tech savvy. They're kind of early adopters, especially you know for their age group on kind of you know the the later end of the millennials. Uh, but they're adopters of new products. They use social media frequently. They use the internet frequently. They're also financially responsible. Um, you know they they tend to invest rather than save their money though. They're kind of smart when it comes to that, so they're not afraid to spend. Um, and definitely uh, more of the DIY type of target audience. They recently remodeled their kitchen. They plan to add solar in the next year, and that's actually adding solar in the next year. That's actually a behavior that we have that we know that this group wants to participate in. So that's actually based on on real data, knowing that this group wants to uh, purchase solar. Uh, and they're also active. You know, they're they're very much a young family. They bike, they hike, they go out and do family activities like sporting events, and movies, and things like that. So given all of that information, we can kind of, uh, you know, those are some of the key key takeaways from this group and we can kind of craft our messaging and, and marketing approach based on some of that uh, useful information I just talked about. So for each of these personas, we're going to look at recommended mess messaging, visual cues, and what sort of media are they using, what's the best media to uh, target this group with. So in terms of messaging, I want to talk about smart use of finances. Choose where to spend your money. Stress that investment, stress that ROI. This is a group with a little bit more disposable income than a couple of the other ones we'll look at. So it's all about investing in the future. Uh, talk about smart, tech-savvy messaging. Visual cues, you want to focus on the young family imagery, the active lifestyles. Make sure we keep it ethnically diverse uh, and kind of well-kept middle-class home. Media, this is definitely a group where we would want to focus more on digital media uh, in addition to radio and, radio and TV. But I think primarily here we would do things like uh, organic and paid social media, paid search, uh, digital display ads. Uh, and you know, play on that idea that they're more tech savvy and they're frequent users of social media. Our second target audience is uh, what we refer to as seeking stability. So demographics here, again, this is a, a little lower income level, also slightly uh, higher median age. So we're talking you know, late 30s here, kind of a mix of blue collar and white collar. Not so much a family, we're going to see individuals here more often than not, single or divorced, uh, but again, a, a diverse uh, group in terms of ethnicity um, and a slightly lower uh, total customer count as well. So this persona we refer to as Kurt. He's a single African-American male. He's in his mid-30s working in sales. Maybe he's making about 55000 a year or so. Uh, doesn't take great care of his home, doesn't have a ton of disposable income, but you know he would eventually like to do something like remodel a, a certain room of his house, his house maybe. Um, he's also someone that's currently looking for a new job. He's not quite satisfied where he is. Um, he's going back to school to complete his bachelor's degree, so definitely someone that wants to take that next step in life, feels like he's kind of stuck, but you know wants to climb that ladder and, and is making moves to, to make that happen. Uh, doesn't do make a lot of investments, feels they're too risky, uh, doesn't, again, doesn't have that disposable income, uh, watches a very large amount of TV and, and trusts TV more than any other uh, media source, um, and consumes little media beyond that with the exception of, you know, using the internet for job search or, or things like that. Uh, so what does this tell us about Kurt? How do we want to message Kurt? Uh, in terms of messaging, getting the most out of your paycheck, making your money go further, bettering yourself, uh, you know, improving your lifestyle and future is the type of messaging we would uh, gear towards him, knowing uh, you know, he's, this is a group that's looking for new jobs, they're going back to school. Visual cues, keeping it ethnically diverse, more of an, an urban audience uh, versus uh, the suburban town audience that we kind of just looked at, uh, and definitely still middle class. Media, I mentioned, obviously TV would be a big one here, and then online ads, and I think also uh, direct me uh, excuse me, direct mail would be an effective uh, method here as well. Uh, 
the last target audience here is surviving, not thriving. Here we have, again, this is the lowest of the three in terms of income level, uh, also the oldest in age, so we're looking about mid-40s here. Uh, definitely more of a blue-collar group, and again, we're talking mostly individuals, so it's going to be single or divorced individuals. Uh, still a fairly ethnically diverse audience, which we really saw across all three of these targets. A uh, little less educated high school diploma versus uh, some of the college education we've seen. Uh, and then in terms of total target population, this is uh, the smallest of the three um, by a decent margin. So this persona is someone we refer to as Emma. She's a divorced white female in her early 50s with no children. Uh, she's a high school graduate working full-time as a hairdresser. Um, you know, she's lived in her house a very long time at this point, but doesn't really invest much in the property, doesn't spend a lot of time making renovations or anything like that. Um, she kind of feels like she's stuck where she is in terms of her career and her living situation. She reads a lot of newspapers uh, and, you know, the occasional soap opera digest or, or magazine of that nature, watches high volume of TV, which is usually daytime TV, soap operas, game shows, reality television, uh, things of that nature. Generally pretty risk averse, but she does purchase lottery and scratch tickets, uh, but again, doesn't have a lot of money to spend on things like luxury items or dining out. So with this information, messaging, it should be all about financial control, all about lowering your bills, be very direct with the messaging, speak to you know the immediate need for Emma of lower bills, minimal risk, uh, avoid any type of tech speak. Visual cues, again, should focus on the individual versus the family and should be a, you know, a little more traditional and blue collar feel to them. Uh, in media, I think this would definitely be a good opportunity for a direct mail campaign. Obviously, we know she watches TV and reads the newspaper as well, so local TV newspaper would be a good medium as well. So those are our three uh, target audience, our customer personas. At this point, I'm going to go a little bit into where they're located geographically. Um, and I know not everyone on the call is from Connecticut, but you'll see this kind of, this is kind of the last piece of the puzzle. And I think you'll see it all kind of come together in terms of how this can be made into a really a full-fledged marketing campaign using both the geography and what we just talked about. And then I'll also talk about some ways that this can be applied to uh, you know, other states at more of a national level. So the actual versus potential report is what we call this. This analyzes the penetration of the imported data, which in this case is the original customer list we received from Connecticut Green Bank, and it compares it to the potential for a specified behavior, which in this case is purchasing solar. So the actual market penetration refers to existing customers within a given uh, geographic area versus potential market expansion, which measures the likelihood of that geographic area to purchase solar. So what can this answer for us? This can say, this can tell us how is my business performing? What is the best strategic approach to take in each of uh, my markets? Uh, where are my opportunities for growth? Where should I invest my marketing budget? Where should I place new locations in my market? So from this report, we get four different strategies. Each of these strategies is basically named after what it's telling you to do. So we start with dominate. And basically this is saying, you have a high actual penetration within this market and you were expected to have a high penetration, high potential, high actual. So you are performing as expected. Basically keep dominating that market. Keep your thriving there. Continue your efforts. Invest is low actual penetration versus high potential. So you're expected to do good in these markets, but you're underperforming. So this is a uh, you know, high potential opportunity for a significant ROI. This is really where you want to you know, highest potential for expansion and, and a good place to focus any uh, marketing budget. Maintain is high actual low potential. So you're performing better than expected in these markets. Uh, there's high penetration rates, but it's really, uh, you know, kind of an outlier. We weren't really expected to do well in those markets. So the strategy is to maintain efforts, but I'll get back to that uh, in a couple slides. And then the last strategy is innovate, which is low actual low potential. So you weren't expected to do well in a market and you're not doing well. So the strategy here is uh, to innovate, change your efforts, you know, change your product, but generally it's a place where you don't want to uh, invest money uh, before some of these other strategies. So this map just shows us, uh, it kind of color codes those strategies and shows us where these specific geographic areas are. We don't need to spend too much time on this, but I think the first thing that jumps out at us is 
the Innovate uh, counties across the map. And if we don't want to focus on Innovate, then we take those out immediately and we're able to have a much more focused marketing approach. This is another extremely useful piece of information where within each of our target audiences, we are able to, I, I pulled out the dominate and invest uh, zip codes and we're able to look at not only which zip codes we have potential customers in, but how many potential customers and what's their likelihood to purchase solar. Uh, so if we were to conduct a marketing campaign, this would be really useful information in terms of uh, where some of the best places to start are from a, a geographic standpoint. And I'll go through these maps really quickly. This is just a map of where the uh, actual customers are laid out uh, within the state of Connecticut. So this is our first uh, customer group. This is seeking stability. And this would be surviving, not thriving. So it just kind of shows you where in the uh, state our actual customers are. So the analysis of this report, uh, based on these four strategies, we would recommend focusing on dominate and invest because those are the, the strategies with the highest uh, probable expansion. Um, you know, it, it doesn't make as much sense to focus on a, a section, a geographic area like maintain or, or innovate simply because there's just not as much room for expansion. And one thing that this doesn't take into consideration is that with solar, we're not selling a product on a regular basis to the same customers. You make one purchase and uh, you know that's basically it. It's not like selling Coca-Cola where you are in a maintain uh, county and you expect them to continue buying your product. So I think maintain kind of takes a back seat here with uh, solar, whereas with other products, maybe it's, it gets bumped up a little more. But here we're considering the maintain zip code uh, a secondary target at best. Um, whereas innovate, we're basically saying avoid altogether um, you know, until unless you have unlimited funds and you go through your other markets, there's no reason to focus on uh, innovate uh, before the others. So focusing on dominate and invest over those two, it narrows down the Connecticut market to 32% of the state population right off the bat. So, like I was saying, immediately allows for a more significantly uh, focused marketing strategy, um, and then you can narrow it down even further once you get into specific zip codes uh, and, and some other factors. Uh, so this is uh, the last piece of geography, just uh, a quick overview of you know how this might apply to other areas of the country. Like I was saying, each of these target audiences is made up of a number of different prism segments. So each prism segment has their own geographic locations. They have their own kind of overview. I've included each of those, a little blurb about them in the appendix of this. So feel free to take a look at that uh, afterwards. Uh, and basically it'll show you you know where the, where on the map uh, each of these is located. And we pulled out some of the the key states here and then take a look at the urbanicity. Are they, are they urban? Are they metro mix? Are they more of a, a country demographic? Uh, so take a look at that. Uh, then I'll go into a little bit more about the potential marketing strategies that I referred to a few minutes ago. We'll dive into those a little bit deeper. Um, starting with digital media, use paid and organic social media, use search engine marketing. Targeted digital display ads to reach your audience. Obviously, again, you want to focus on the audiences that we know actually use these uh, technologies, these uh, mediums. So focus on Judy and Dante rather than the second two. Uh, they're the ones that we know are on social media. They're on internet. They have smartphones. And with platforms like Facebook and Google, you can actually target specific prism segments uh, with high potential zip codes. So you can actually say, I want to target you know, these two segments within this target audience and you know you'll be hitting your exact customer within the exact zip code. Uh, digital mail is, a, or, excuse me, direct mail is another uh, great potential marketing tactic. Uh, utilize zip codes identified as high potential areas to reach your audience and you can, um, you know, you can narrow it down by zip code and, and find a, a list that services a, a certain number of uh, zip codes. You can do a search for this uh, online and find brokers that are willing to to provide those lists for you and help you narrow down your, your target audience. Uh, local advertising, TV, radio, print, outdoor advertising. Um, again, identify the most commonly used forms of media within your target audience. So maybe it's not all of those, but maybe it's, um, maybe it's Kurt who had a high propensity to watch TV. Um, combine that with outdoor advertising, um, which is still definitely a, a valid form of communication, whether it's on billboards or public transit or 
you know, high traffic areas in malls and building lobbies and having signage there. Uh, one thing about local advertising, we'll say traditional broadcast television tends to be fairly expensive uh, and will reach, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of, there tends to be a lot of waste, especially depending on your market in uh, Connecticut in particular, um, has some complications with that. Um, so be careful about how you spend on traditional broadcast television, but cable TV and uh, internet TV allows for a more targeted approach, uh, more efficient use of your marketing dollars. And then really with any paid marketing campaign, we would recommend some sort of community outreach uh, to effectively reach your audience. Um, you know, do some canvassing, get boots on the ground, meet your customer in person, talk to them, figure out what they want, um, you know, get partnerships with local organizations, local community groups, faith-based in institutions, and, uh, and kind of get them at the ground level. So sample messaging and creative, uh, we developed some sample ads just based on each of the three target audiences that I went over. Um, so you know, each of these target audiences, as I've discussed, has different lifestyle behaviors, they have different traits, they use different forms of media, um, they can be in different parts of the state or the country, but it's kind of one common denominator with each of these is that, especially with low to moderate income, uh, customers, really it's going to end up at the end of the day, it's going to be about saving money. And there's different ways that you can position that. You can position it as cutting your bills, as investing in the future. Um, and so think about your target audience and how you can craft that idea to, to fit with what they're really looking for. But, but really we find time and time again that the, the driver in sales is uh, about saving money, especially with, again, the low to moderate income. Uh, so in this section, I'll talk a little bit about using priority uh, cluster data and how we can go about uh, forming a full marketing strategy. So again, marketing efforts are really only as good as their data. And like with this particular project, we had we started with a very solid list from Connecticut Green Bank with all the information we could have possibly wanted. And we were able to develop a really thorough, uh, you know, insight and a data set based on that information. So. Start with that and then you can use it to define your target audience, create relevant messaging, reach your audience through the preferred channels, uh, and maximize your marketing budget uh, through key uh, territories of opportunity. So basically throughout this presentation, we've seen we know who our customer is, we know what media they intake, uh, we know where they are, and we think we have a pretty good idea about how to message them. So that's kind of all the ingredients you need to put together a, a solid marketing plan. So the first step, you want to define your target. Who are you trying to reach? Maybe it's not all three targets, but maybe you want to choose one. Maybe you even want to choose a couple of the individual prism segments within that single target audience. But make sure you know who your target audience is and, uh, and remember it. Don't, you know, don't let the water get, get muddy there. Make sure you focus on that individual target. Um, and make sure you outline an objective for that target. So what are, what are you trying to get people to do? Is it an awareness campaign? Are you generating leads? Would you want them to upgrade? Um, is it just the trial? So make sure you know your target audience and you know exactly what you want them to do. And then of course, determine a budget. Uh, where do you want to spend? And what does a positive ROI look like in the end? What do you want that budget to achieve? And of course, this is an important one, identify a strategy. Uh, how will you get them to do what we want them to do? Uh, where is the target consuming media and how? So again, those are things that we attempt to answer uh, in this presentation in regards to those three target audiences. Then develop the creative. What is the message? What does it look like? Make sure your look and feel of the campaign is the same throughout all of your pieces. If you're focusing on target one, Judy and Dante, make sure, you know, if you do three different pieces, make sure it's the same look and feel, make sure the tone is the same. It should have a really consistent uh, design across the entire campaign. Uh, and again, make sure that you are tailoring that if you are focusing on multiple targets that you tailor that uh, if it's Judy and Dante and Kurt separately, you have kind of your own, they each have their own look and feel. Uh, execute the tactics. So how will your message get across? Again, digital display, direct mail, the uh, different tactics that I just discussed. Um, and make sure you're tracking, make sure you find ways to uh, get valid metrics on all of your, um, all of your mediums whether it's Google Analytics, whether it's working with a media partner that provides some uh, results from the campaign. Um, and then that will allow you to kind of evaluate the campaign. Did it build awareness? Did it have the effect that we were hoping? 
uh, did it drive sales, uh, and then you can kind of take a look at that and then optimize for any you know, marketing efforts in the future. Uh, so using segmentation data at a national level. level. Uh, so again, everything outlined in this deck is for low to moderate income solar customers in Connecticut, but like-minded customers can really be found nationwide. And we know these prism segments, like I mentioned, there's little descriptions about them in the appendix of this, which feel free to take a look at. Um, but that will show you where they can be found, and it's really it's nationwide, um, making targets beyond just uh, what we're looking at here in Connecticut. So you can see if they're in your location, then this might still be a viable target for you. Um, determine if any uh, target is represented within your location, and then you can use Google and Facebook, and you can target, like I said, specific prism segments. Um, and you suggested messaging, visual cues, uh, media outlines in this presentation to uh, reach out to those customers. And again, I mentioned this earlier, but one thing to know with this particular presentation is that when it comes to income levels, if you are targeting low to moderate income, keep in mind Connecticut is uh, on a little bit higher of a scale than some of the other states in, this, in uh, the country, so you're going to see a little higher medium income, a little higher uh, home value. Uh, and that is all of the presentation. Um, again, like I said, the appendix has the descriptions of the PRISM segments, uh, but I think at this point I will open it up to questions. Thank you, Alex, and, and thank you, Isabel, for your very interesting um, presentations. We're going to go to some questions now, um, and I want to um, remind everyone who's, who's on the webinar that you can participate, I'm sorry, you can submit questions by typing them into the question box on the control panel on your screen. And let me just mention um, before we get to the questions that when we um, send out this, this slide deck after the webinar, um, we're going to add another, um, another slide, or the Connecticut Green Bank is going to add another slide um, with a table comparing Connecticut demographics to, to national demographics because as has um, come up a couple of times, they can be quite different in some ways. So let's, um, let's go to some questions. Um, the first question is, can Isabel explain how this analysis has been used and implemented? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so right now, um, we are trying to work with some of our contractors who are servicing our lower income communities, so specifically Positogen, but potentially some others, to help them incorporate this research into their um, marketing plans and also the areas of the state that they're targeting for, um, for their marketing materials. So those are still kind of under development. Already they've been using some of the, the targeted concentration maps to help focus, you know, where they're doing community campaigns or door-to-door -door canvassing. Um, but we are working with them right now to develop more holistic marketing strategy um, to see how effective this research will be in um, helping us access those potential target audiences. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, how granular can segmentation get? More granular than the zip code level? Uh, this was slightly more granular than the zip code level. Um, I think they call it zip code plus six, um, which I think is like the neighborhood level. So this is, it all depends on the list you're starting from. So again, Connecticut Green Bank gave us a really thorough list with specific physical uh, addresses on them. So with that, we were able to get a little bit more granular. And I think you can even go a little bit more granular than where we were at uh, to the individual block level. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, our next question is actually two questions, but they're pretty similar, so I'll ask them together. One is, you identified certain demographics as most likely to go solar. Can you explain a little more slowly how you identified those groups? And the other question is, how did you get from the data you analyzed to the personas you were talking about? Yeah, so basically the output of the initial study, when we provide Claritas with the list of 4,000 customers, what they do is kind of compare it to their data and compare it to the 
um, you know, the prism segments that they have. And what they give us are basically spreadsheets and spreadsheets of data of a number of different behaviors that uh, people around the country or in Connecticut exhibit. So it's anything based on demographics, psychographics, uh, television data, so you know specific shows they watch, specific home improvements they make, so lines and lines of, of these different behaviors, and each one is ranked in terms of the index of that specific uh, behavior. So, like I was saying, if it's over 100, and really we look for over 120, then they're likely to have that behavior. Um, and then if it's under, you know, 100, we know they're not likely to have that behavior. So. Uh, so the behavior of, you know, plans on putting solar panels on their house in the next year, that's one of these behaviors that is basically compared to each of these five target audiences. So we look at target audience uh, three, you know, we look at Judy and Dante and we say, uh, okay, they're indexing at, I don't know what it was off the top of my head, but let's say it was 210 for plans to put solar on their house before the end of the year. Um, that's where we pull that and that's where we pull all the information for these personas we put together. We go through and we kind of say, what are the most telling behaviors in this massive group of behaviors that can kind of give us an insight into who these people really are. So we look for the higher indices um, and what is related to this specific project uh, when it comes to solar. Great. Thank you. Um, and here's another question, and we might want to go back to the slide that's going to be uh, referred to here. On the slide with the five initial groupings, there was an affluent group that was excluded. Could you review that slide to explain how the three out of five groups were chosen? Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so do I, if you want to go back to that slide, but um, that was the one in the beginning with the graphs. Um, so basically we chose the last three because they were a little bit lower uh, on the income scale. The first two were you know, still created using low to moderate uh, income census tract, but the, based on the PRISM segments that made up those groups, they were a little bit more affluent, a little bit higher income. And for the purposes of this presentation and this project, we wanted to focus on these lower income groups. Um, in addition to that, they also had lower indices, which I think kind of goes hand in hand with the fact that they were higher income. Great, thanks. Oh, there we go. There's there's the slide we were uh, talking about. Yeah, so so sensible and secure and affluent urbanites, uh, those were a little bit on the on the upper uh, income scale level. Okay, um, and here's another question, um, and I suppose this one might be for Isabel. What additional consumer protections have been put in place to ensure these targeted marketing campaigns aren't too aggressive? Um, that's a good question. We ha so this is not um, research that is necessarily, it's just information that we're providing to contractors. So I wouldn't say that there's necessarily been any more aggressive targeting campaigns as a result of this research. It's just to kind of inform, you know, where these potential solar customers might be located around the state and different types of messaging that um, would resonate with them. So we do have a lot of consumer protections in place through our residential solar investment program in general. Um, and also we limit the contractors who are accessing our elevated LMI incentive in the RCIP. So that's an extra security level that we have there to ensure that um, they're offering products to the market that are going to have real positive impact for our lower income consumers. But I wouldn't say that there's been any specific consumer protections that we put in place in relationship to this research. Um, it's been mostly through our traditional program offerings. Great. Thank you, Isabel. Um, the next question is, could you quickly review the two-by-two two matrix with low high outreach strategy? And I believe that's referring to the slide that had the, the dominate and the, mm. I'm not remembering what the other categories were. Yep. Yeah, if you just pull up that slide. Yep, there we go. Um, yeah, so basically this matrix, again, to understand this, 
uh, we really have to talk about the actual versus potential again. So the actual is the market penetration in any given zip code. The potential is the potential for the population in that, in that zip code to uh, purchase solar. So when we say high, high, we're saying high actual penetration, high potential to purchase solar. So again, dom the two that I called out were dominate and invest as places we would want to invest because of the high potential. Um, invest in particular has high potential and low actual. So there's not a lot of penetration in those markets, but you know, based on our research, there really should be. So that's a great place to invest marketing dollars. Whereas the other two strategies are, there's a, a low potential based on what we know here that you know, the population in these zip codes are going to uh, purchase solar. Um, so that's really all that matrix is showing is uh, you know, where low and low meet, that's innovate, where high and high meet, that's dominate. And again, that refers to actual versus potential. Great, thank you. Our next question is, um, are these customer profiles likely to be very different in other state markets? Or could other states use the customer profile analysis and overlay that on the zip code in their jurisdiction? Um, I think, like I was saying, you're going to find similar customers throughout the country for sure. And again, you can look at the maps in the back and see um, if they have overlap with your geographic area. Um, there's actually, Claritas actually offers a free tool as well where you can go on their website and you can actually look up your own zip code or your target zip code and see what the top five segments are in that area, um, which can definitely be useful. Um, I certainly think that there's some takeaways from this presentation that you can use to apply uh, to your target audience if you're, you know, maybe you're also looking at low to moderate income solar purchasers, uh, maybe, um, maybe you think your state has a similar demographics to Connecticut. Um, ideally, what you're going to want to do is, is do a, a similar uh, study within your own state. Um, but I certainly think that if there's overlap in terms of the geography of the segments, then you can definitely use some of this information. Okay, thank you. Um, we got a question. I, I think I, I think I know the answer to this one, and you can tell me if this is correct. The question is, where does the data come from to identify the potential within communities to adopt solar? And I believe the data was based on people who participated in Connecticut's solar incentive program. Is that is that correct? Yep, that's correct. So <clears throat> if anyone who's gone through, gone solar and accessed an incentive through our residential solar investment program, and then we isolated those customers in the data set um, to customers that specifically live in a census tracts earning less than 80% of the area of median income. Great, thank you, Isabel. Our next question is, in using this segmentation analysis, would it make more sense to focus on the particular households trying to reach the particular households identified or on the communities where those households are? Um, sorry, could you repeat that question one more time? In using this segmentation analysis, would it make more sense to focus on the households identified or on the communities where those households are? Um, well, I wouldn't say you can target specific households necessarily. Uh, you know, you can with, uh, if you're able to conduct a direct mail campaign and, and purchase a list within certain zip code um, and with direct or with uh, digital media, you're able to uh, specifically target certain segments, um, but I think generally you're going to be in many ways forced to focus on the geographic area rather than individual households. You're just going to have to look to see, you know, to what extent is my target audience present in a given zip code, and that can help you. From there, you can kind of narrow it down and say, okay, I'll leave out that geographic area, but we want to focus more on here, um, and then that's where some of the other marketing strategies come in with uh, you know, local advertising, um, boots on the ground, community outreach type things. Um, but for the most part, you won't be able to target, you know, the specific household. I, I would just add to that um, that we've actually seen great success 
both doing kind of door-to-door -door canvassing, but also partnering with community organizations, especially that's one technique that um, Positive employs quite a bit. And so having that two-pronged approach can be really effective because you're getting the message out through a trusted community partner, but then also you're seeing, you know, faces in the community are having direct contact with potential customers so that they can ask you specific questions if they're more interested in going solar. So I don't think it has to be one or the other. I think that a combined approach can be really effective. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm afraid we're very close to the end of the hour here, so we're going to wrap it up. And I apologize for not being able to get to all of the questions. Um, we do encourage people with more questions to get in touch with the presenters directly, and their emails are included on an earlier slide in this presentation, which will be emailed out to um, all of everyone who's registered for the webinar. So thank you very much to our presenters and to all of you for tuning in to our webinar today. I'm going to turn things um, back over to Samantha for some final words. Samantha, are you there? OK, well, I will um, just say a few Sorry, words about Diana. I was muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, well, either of us could mention this. Um, we do have an upcoming webinar that we hope people can attend. Um, this is on Thursday, December 14th. It's from 1 to 2 p.m. And the topic it will be, it will be a follow-up discussion on today's webinar, uh, customer, customer Acquisition for LMI Solar Programs. And we will be joined by uh, let's see, speakers from Grid Alternatives. I believe, and um, Diana, remind me who the other guest speaker will be. Uh, Posigen, as well as the Posigen. speakers from today's webinar. Excellent. Well, you can register for that webinar on our website at cisa.org backslash webinars. And to finish up, um, on your screen is some information where you can contact our host from today's webinar, Diana Chase. And uh, more information is on our website, cisa.org, backslash pro projects, backslash sustainable dash solar. You can also find more information on our website at cisa.org. And we are also on Facebook and Twitter. And that's it for today. Thanks, everybody.